Good evening, everyone. On behalf of SEPT University, I'd like to welcome you all. Before we begin today's program, may I request everyone to kindly switch off their cell phones. Um, may I request Dr. Bimal Patel to introduce our speaker, Rahul Mehrotra, today. Okay, so students, faculty members, members of the staff, I see alumni here, Rajiv Lalbai, who represents the Ben Lilavati Ben Lalbai Trust here. He's one of the trustees. And friends, welcome, welcome to this evening presentation. We are here to see Rahul Merotra's design for the Lilavati Lalbai Library and to hear him talk about it. Thank you, Rahul, for this presentation that you're about to make. Before Rahul commences, I would like to say a few words about our proposed new library. About one year ago, Sanjay Lalbai, our chairman, chairman of our board of management, who was speaking on behalf of the trustees of the Ben Lilavati, Lilavati Lalbai Trust, expressed a desire to donate about six crore rupees for building a new facility at SEPT University. Most of you may not know who Lilavati Lalbhai was, so let me say a few words about who she was. <laughs> Lilavati Lalbhai was Kasturbai Lalbhai's youngest sister. Kasturbai Lalbhai, of course, for those who do not know, was the tallest and the most civic-minded business leader of 20th century Ahmedabad. It was with his support that SEPT University was originally established. Our campus is named after Kasturbai. This uh, Lilavati Ben was his youngest sister. Lilavati Lalbai was a much loved member of the Lalbai family. The present generation speaks very fondly of her. From the way they describe her, it is clear that she had a very noble character. It is also clear that she held highly progressive values. She was never married, but played a very important role in the upbringing and education of many of her nephews and nieces. They all remember her very fondly. But this was not all. She was also known for her managerial prowess. All her life, she very successfully and efficiently managed Raipur Mills, one of the mills in the Lalbai stable. She was a simple person, never interested in being in the limelight. Lilavati Lalbai also had a deep and abiding interest in education. This is why her beautiful house, which was designed by Claude Batley and measure drawn by many people at SEPT University, is now used as a schooling facility. On behalf of everyone at SEPT University, I'm very thankful for the, to the trustees of the Ben Lilavati Lalbai Trust for reposing their trust in our university and for their decision to support the building of a new facility at our university. Thank you very much. With the availability of resources, I discussed the question of what facility we should build with colleagues at the university. We quickly came to the conclusion that it would be best to build a new library. There are many things needed on our campus, but we thought we should start with a library. Our present library is stressed, all of us know that. For very long, it has needed upgrading. And everyone agreed that while we need many new facilities, we should start with this. I presented this idea to the building committee, and they too readily agreed. Many of you may not know or be familiar with the building committee. The building committee at SEPT University was established three years ago by the board of management to oversee and guide all building works on the campus. It, the building committee was mandated to gradually upgrade and expand the campus so that our students may have the best possible learning facilities. The building committee has four members. It's chaired by Praful Anubai, who is from our governing body, and who is also head of Ahmedabad University. He's also part of Ahmedabad Education Society and a senior member 
uh, of the educational fraternity in Ahmedabad. The next person on the building committee is Achal Bakeri, who many of you might know. He trained as an architect. He's an alum from SEPT University, but he never practiced architecture. He became a business person and now is a well, extremely well-known and successful business person of Ahmedabad. Uh, and he, he also serves on our building committee and helps guide our decisions on what we should do. Then we have a member of the faculty here, one of, uh, and, and originally we had Krishna Ben Shastri on the building committee. Presently, Reshma Ben Shah of the faculty of technology serves on the building committee. And finally, the fourth member on the building committee is the president of SEPT University, which is myself. Once the building committee had decided on building a new library building, we requested our campus master planner, Christopher Benninger, to identify a location and to block out the new facility. After considering a number of alternative locations and following discussions with senior faculty members, Christopher and the building committee settled on the location where the new where, where the NBO building, L NBO block stands at present. It made sense to locate the building there because then the library would be easily accessible by all the different faculties and become a hub holding all the faculties together. The library would also have a significant presence on the campus by virtue of its location and provide a clear identity to the university. The next job then was to select an architect for the new building. The building committee was clear that it wanted an architect who is presently and meaningfully engaged with contemporary art architectural challenges. It was also very clear that in keeping with the liberal traditions of the university, it wanted the campus architecture to be unified, but also to be diverse, accommodating of new needs while respecting the past. After considering various alternatives, all of us in the building committee, as well as the trustees of the Ben Lilavati Lalbai Trust, did not have to de deliberate much before settling upon Rahul Merotra's name. We all absolutely agreed that he would be ideally suited to be the architect of our new library. As you all know very well, Rahul really doesn't need introduction here, He's a highly accomplished architect with a fine body of work to his credit and a formidable international reputation. He's at home in India and internationally engaged, fully conversant with latest developments in architecture and education all over the globe. On top of this, he's an alum of our university and shares our values. He's really one of us. So really, there was not much to think about after this name came up. Rahul chose to collaborate locally with Akruti Architects, which is led by Dilip Patil, and therefore Dilip Patil and Akruti Architects are now part of Rahul's team helping build the library. Once Rahul had started off work, we created a design review group within the university that would review the design as it got developed, and that group included the following people. We had Professor Srivatsan, who is academic director, of SEPT University sitting through all of the discussions. Krishna Ben Shastri, Dean of the Faculty of Design. Pratyush Shankar, who at that, when he was here, and through a major portion was Acting Dean of the Faculty of Architecture. Snehal Shah, who is Director of SEPT Library. Tejaswini Ben, who is the SEPT Librarian. Reshma Ben Shah, who is from the Faculty of Technology. Ashish Chani, Campus Engineer and myself as president of the university. All of us sat through lovely discussions as the design evolved and, we, and, and, and developed. The project management for this project, for it will need a lot of management. We plan to finish it in one year. We'll need a lot of management and you will all have to bear with the trouble of construction going on in the middle of the campus. We'll try and minimize it. The campus, uh, the project management is going to be headed by the campus office. Reshma Ben Shah, who, who oversees all improvement and building projects, repairs and building projects, along with Professor Bhargav Tevar of 
Faculty of Technology and Ashish Chani will be managing the project. Uh, the, once the library is built, the job of maintenance will be once again that of the campus office. Uh, as you all know, Professor Mercy Samuels, the Faculty of Management, supported by Ajay Patil and Divya Sharma, manage the facilities and they will do so. Since we commenced work on designing the new library, the building committee has also extended Rahul's brief to include, include development of the Shrenik Bai Plaza, the central plaza of our school, and upgrading the cafe canteen. This is a very new development. And the reason why we want to take this work up early is because in February 2017, we are going to have a major international event here, the Archipri, and we would like the library as well as the plaza, if possible, in good shape so that we can put up a nice face for that event. So we have a lot of construction work to do over the coming year. Those of us who have been involved in development of the design for the new library believe that the design of the new library building supports SEPT University's rejuvenation and modernization. It supports its renewed focus on teaching and research, its integrated functioning, its commitment to cosmopolitan and liberal values, and above all, its commitment to excellence in architecture. But you know, that is precisely what all of you are here to see and check out for yourself and talk about. You're all wondering what meanings the architecture of the new library will evoke. You're all wondering what its architecture will say about our values and about us. So without delaying further, I will now let Rahul get on with his presentation on design of the Lilawati Lalbai Library and his preliminary thoughts on the Serenic Bay Plaza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bimal, for that very, very nice introduction to set up uh, this presentation. But before I start, I want to just say, you know, the, the last time I felt so nervous at SEPT was in 1982 at my final review. And uh, seeing Nimesh, Parul, and others here, I'm sort of uh, beginning to get the same jitters, uh, uh, presenting something that's not built, because one has since then been doing lectures where you present what's built, and you know you can claim its success, and you can point out its failures. But this is the first time since 1982 at this place with such an audience, one is presenting something that's not built. So it feels very much like my final year review, which was a neighborhood school in, in the polls, uh, in uh, yeah, in the poll area. The other thing is that it's interesting. I, this slide was just added on, and only recently I knew that this was going to be named after Leelawati Ben. And my thesis, which was on Claude Batley, involved measuring the house. So in the library, there are drawings in this thesis of Leelawati Ben's house, which Claude Batley designed. And it's funny, like many things in life, some things come round a circle and it sort of spooks you a little bit. Uh, and so uh, I just wanted to say that. And the third thing I you know, wanted to <clears throat> say just to preface this um, presentation, uh, which uh, uh, is that you know, it's really, I mean, when Bimal first and Srivats and others suggested this idea of coming and doing a presentation, I first thought, oh my gosh, one has been reading the blogs. We've done the exhibition. Should one be doing the presentation? But then I felt that you know it is really i think this is very significant that we are even collectively doing this because it's a real shift in culture you know i've been part of universities in the us and many other places I don't know where buildings have been made so much part of the public domain. Uh, they are just done. You suddenly are told who's doing it. It's an ex-dean, a new dean. Someone takes it within the university and does it. And so one is, um, you know, I just want to highlight, because it kind of prefaces also my commitment to doing this and being involved, that there clearly is a shift in culture. Of course, we, a lot of us, uh, straddle many decades uh, of involvement with SEPT. SEPT was 120 or 150 people. I think when Nimesh and all left, it was even 100. By the time I was studying here with planning, it was 120. It was a big family. 
Suddenly, it is a massive, it is SEPT University. And of course, there have to be cultural shifts and they are the pains of growing up, like in adolescence. Uh, these are difficult and awkward pains. Uh, but I think, um, you know, it's important if we have to thrive in an environment that speaks to this kind of new form of the place. And so I think I'm really delighted that so many of you are here, that we are all collectively participating to share. What I'm going to share with you <clears throat> is the process that one has undertaken with the committee. And so there are collective ideas which have informed and shifted the direction of the building and uh, made different things happen. And lastly, what would have been nice, I forgot to tell Chirayu, was to put in brackets next to my name, 1176, which was my code, because that's some, a number that you live with for many years, uh, and you don't forget, and suddenly I remember it, and it would have been nice, which is to really also say that <clears throat> one spent a lot of time here. I was unfortunately, and I say this with some embarrassment, part of that era where we took a long time to finish, uh, and uh, uh, the only question I've been asked three times I got new appointments in three American universities was, was this a nine-year undergraduate course? Uh, then in other places, what happened? So that's the one thing I've always had to explain. But um, they were wonderful years. And of course, one experienced this incredible place. For me, this is historic. And uh, it's like building in the poles, or it's like building in the fourth district of Mumbai. I mean, this is, uh, this is probably one of the most significant buildings of contemporary India, clearly so. And I start with this slide because this moment is, I mean, this is just the most wonderful moment in the building of this staircase, which intersects a social spot. Uh, I mean, even the dogs are comfortable sleeping there. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just a poetic moment. And it's uh, something one, you know, one learned architecture in a place like this. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the studios, places we've all spent a lot of time. <coughs> of course, there are different perceptions. I'll never forget in 1976 when I was applying, my father was rather worried. He was a very avisual person, and he decided to make a trip to check out the school. And he came back and he said, you know, you can decide if you want to do architecture, but be careful. This place really manages their funds very badly. They ran out of money and didn't plaster the walls. Uh, <laughs> And then he said that they had no money. They didn't even put hinges on the doors uh, because of the pivoted. So I was rather confused. But of course, when one came here, one fell in love with it. And it has a particular <coughs> vocabulary, a particular architecture, a suggestion of what could have been, which is important for me. Those extending beam beams are like, like a ghost presence because it tells you, you know, this is intended to grow. Was it? Was it not? And then, of course, there are the micro-level things, which <coughs> this might have been rebuilt, but I know we built this in 1980 or something in our summer uh, program. So there are also fragments that we all get connected to, which get built. Uh, and one remembers them also fondly. <coughs> there have been accretions over the years. And one of the things that has struck me very much is the fragmented nature of the campus. Uh, I mean, studying here, even this wing didn't exist. This auditorium didn't exist. And since I've noticed many things, including the Canoria Center, and we'll come to that question, because it becomes a really important question. What do you see as the form of this campus? And uh, <coughs> some of these accretions, the cafeteria, new things. What is their life cycle? Are these intended uh, to respond to different generations and their needs? Uh, do these become things that we get nostalgic about and deter uh, any other form of change? But that's why it's really, if, I mean, I think the approach we've taken is to deal with it as a historic, contemporary historic environment and, and question each one of these things. And, and we can have a discussion about that. And some things one is also not very clear about oneself. One is struggling with this and with the committee we discuss this very often. So the way I've just structured this, and I've <clears throat> really done no new drawings for this, uh, this is all the material we've discussed, except for the plaza, which I'll show you at the end, which I've not even actually shared with the committee. And I've just taken, well, I won't use the word risk, but it, to propose to you at least what we are thinking, what are the possibilities, et cetera. So I think even for Bimal and Srivats and the other people on the committee, this is just new ideas just to get feedback. Uh, and this really happened, like Bimal said, because suddenly we found the building, there were a lot of questions of building which were related to the site.
site. And unless one dealt with at least the outlines of the plaza, one could move, couldn't move further. So, sorry, these are the uh, sections. It's just uh, looking at the site, the questions I've already introduced, then going really into the design proposal as a process. Uh, and then, you know, our preliminary discussions about facade details, what should be the nature of finishes that picks on what we have, but also extends it into some forms of newness, and then the plaza as the last thing. So if you look at the site, so looking at the, this is what the site looks like. And uh, it's, uh, it's, again, very interesting because, I mean, the question, of course, that came first is, that what is, what is the framework we should follow? Because these are the original buildings. Well, this one is the original building that Doshi did. This was the first extension. This was the addition. And this is the workshop, which was the site office, uh, which we can discuss. And of course, the suggestion that this building should extend as an armature, it never happened. But instead, things got built all over the place, which have completely different footprints. They have completely different architectures. They have completely different scales. And they have completely different suggestions of even the life cycle of these buildings. Because some of them seem, oh my god, these were built for 20 years. Some seem like, oh my gosh, these were built for longer. So actually, what does one do in a case like this? And, and I think one approach that we kind of implicitly took was that the only co occurs here. And really, I yet feel strongly about that, that if anything should happen, this should extend, and that you would get an armature which kind of defined a corner, uh, which would make the image of the school, allowing the other areas to transform additively uh, because the footprints are so different, all actually by the same architect. And they're all interesting buildings in themselves. And so, of course, it raises a question when you come into a landscape like this, which, if, like I said, one deals with as a historic landscape. How do you intervene in this so it becomes extremely difficult? Uh, and those are sort of you know, the fragments that you see more clearly, uh, some added more recently, some much later. Now, that was the site that we were given uh, as part of the process of the master plan, which uh, uh, Bimal spoke a little bit about. Uh, it, it, it be, of course, <clears throat> as any architect does, you question that right away and say, why here, why not there, why not there? And obviously, I went up and met with Christopher Benninger. He had a fantastic document where he had analyzed everything, the different leases, the different institutes. And some have even put barbed wire to demarcate their area. So the different contestations that occurred. And uh, it seemed like, anyway, the master planner had arrived at this as the appropriate location for many reasons, including to do with the fact to command the plaza to give coherence to a center of the, of the campus, which didn't exist with the school becoming so big with so many diverse uh, uh, faculties. And so anyway, we accepted that. Uh, I, I, it was something that we had to uh, work with. And uh, we, we were convinced that it seemed to be the right place. And then the notion that, OK, how does then one advantageously use that as a hub for the campus? And so how does one make it a hub that could be interesting? So that was just the preliminary thoughts at the site level. So one then jumped to precedence, and one began to naturally look at all the great libraries that one <laughs> thinks about. Because in a fragmented kind of condition, the big question becomes whether you should do a big footprint, or should one also create a series of networked fragments, which maybe one can imagine is possible today with new technologies, uh, and that you have a, a library which is broken up into many bits and nestles all over the place. Clearly, for the scale that we were talking about, that did not seem so practical, because you know, look at the coolness that we have in this room. Ahmedabad is very hot, so you have archival material. If you want to air condition the space, how do you make it comfortable? How is the library a place of comfort? comfort also within the campus. And it just made sense also for the scale of the books that we have here to centralize it. And of course, it's not the scale of these great libraries at Yale or in Exeter, with, which Louis Kahn did, or even some of the historic ones. Uh, but there are many advantages when one looked at these libraries of its centralization. So of course, one came back to the site and accepted it for many reasons. And the, the first ideas that sort of came to us were naturally respecting the existing architecture. We also thought that there should be a likeness and transparency, so it's inviting. Uh, and uh, it, it stands apart from the heaviness of the buildings around, which are beautiful in their own way. Uh, a neutral orientation was very critical, because one of the things we were told, I'm going to use the word client and refer to the committee uh, in this case, was that 
the campus had got fragmented. There's interior design, there's building construction, et cetera. And how can everyone relate to this in some equal way, that it's not responding to one faculty uh, uh, solely? Uh, the idea of multiple associations for me is very important, something of a feeling and an approach I developed here in my own uh, final year studio that I was alluding to, where how different people on the campus uh, associate with the building differently. So therefore, multiple entrances become one. So you might use an, a different entrance at different stages of your time here for different things, where you rendezvous with friends, where you go in when you want to be discreet to study. So a building, I think, in an institution, I believe, it's important to think of how the building could potentially create for you multiple associations at different times when you're studying at exams, when you're under stress. The building should have the opportunity for you to find different spots which you can sort of take solace in. Uh, and then contemporary expression was, at least for me, a given. And when I mean, when I use the word contemporary expression here, it means that, of course, one has to be respectful of what here and what we are sitting in and what exists, uh, which was also contemporary at some point. For me, it's historic now in a positive way, not to say it's backward, but that, you know, it's been six decades. So how, do one, how does one respond to other materials, other things we might have learned? And then the idea of centering it on the campus. So obviously, that became a given. That was the footprint. Uh, and we began to start, you know, beginning to study how one can use the building to create relationships in the future, to create some kind of structure which might implicitly suggest ways that these fragments could come together. And of course, for neutrality, something, you know, the Anu Anup Talao we are looking at, and I think Fatehpur Sikri is interesting because it is like that, fragments. But there are one or two things that kind of center it. And so how can a building be centered with four entrances? So there's nothing maybe like a main entrance. It might be a main entrance by default because it's on the plaza, but the fact is that they're all equally dealt with. So people coming from other parts of the campus are also feeling the scale and the suggestion and the facade is the same. Uh, and, and then this idea that it could be something contained. So how do you reduce the footprint? Because we were given a footprint. We were given a mass. It was actually quite a large mass, which went up five or six floors that we could do, because that's what was needed. But then with the committee, we began working about how can we fragment it, because one wasn't comfortable with that mass. Uh, and then how does one place the building within some other definition? And that outer definition comes from this structure that one kind of discerned from the site, uh, as I showed you with those grids and things. And then within that, you put in something that's also smaller. So how do you create connections? Then how do you, when you talk about the building, handcraft these details, yet create a strong presence? So you know, by saying that we don't want a big volume, we want a small volume. But then how do you create a presence becomes? And then, of course, talking about questions of what I call passive sustainability, because sustainability becomes this word that we don't quite understand. Uh, and so this was really the first concept diagram, which is, is the site plan that I showed you, where we create something and put something in it and then cover it with a roof. Uh, that way, uh, the volume of books, the requirements, are kind of submerged in this void that we create. And then it gives us the flexibility to play with the roof in terms of relationships with things around the campus. So it becomes sort of two uh, components. So this is the proposal. We, of course, spent a lot of time. The library had also grown since I was a student. And uh, you know now it's about 35,000 books. The requirements that we were given was we should project to 90,000 books. And I think we've designed it for 100,000 books so that it can be phased in. And there were interesting additions that we saw, like this loft that's been put in there. And you, know, you can say that, my god, these are really awkward. But then we also found that for some people, they were very intimate. And so this, the, just by default, there was this sort of uh, 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 a condition where you had different kinds of spaces out of other contingencies, not out of design necessarily, because we needed more space, et cetera. So we looked at how people were using it every time we could come, and you know, little glances. And then, of course, we found the sense of crowdedness. And, uh, and then the idea that how do you, from one level, break it down? Because there's also a hierarchy of these books. Some things are need for references. Some things are on a daily basis because they are 
reserve, et cetera. And so that became the diagram of this outer container, uh, and then within that, something that sort of sits in. And so this was broadly uh, the brief. Uh, we said we'll aspire for 100,000 books, go even 10,000 more than the requirements, um, uh, because we were now going under the ground. Uh, we just felt that we should keep that margin. There's also an archive that's building here, which is an amazingly important addition, maybe in the interim till it takes on that volume. It can also be housed here before it finds its own home, perhaps. Uh, and then, you know, reading rooms, formal reading, informal, digital access, carols for thesis students, et cetera, seminar rooms where even small discussions could happen, an area for exhibitions, uh, you know, even dumb waiters for books so that you can have an efficiency, and then all the backup uh, that you would need. So this is broadly, after much discussion, uh, the brief that was evolved uh, with the committee. And of course, we went to translate this uh, into looking at what, you know, how you could break the books down, what are the volumes, how do they get sort of spread dif between different things, but also the flow of information in retrieving books and getting books back. So a lot of this sort of uh, was the preliminary work we did with the committee and the subcommittee of the library uh, and the relationships of different kind of functions to each other. And based on that, we came up with uh, this kind of diagram, which essentially takes an entrance level at the ground level, and then it has reading facilities up, which are, which are very transparent, light, but under shade. Uh, and then you have levels of carols, books, seminar rooms, which sort of go down to the basement. Of course, the lowest basement is just things on, uh, on, on, on rollers where you have stacked storage. So it's not places where people sit and there's no, nat there's no it's all artificial light, but it, as many levels as possible we've bought in natural light uh, in the way you have here, but of course much more natural light because we have, and so, uh, we have courtyards in a sense. And so the library built up area, finally we've set, sort of settled to is about 2,800, so 30,000 square feet, uh, and that's the carpet area um, that we've sort of arrived at. And this is just the process of how we sort of looked at it. Uh, this is how you see it cut down. These are older schemes, I'll show you the new scheme, but it was always about trying to create these re relationalities between what was sort of around it or if it went higher. So here this is 8.5, that goes 9.1. So one is to the bottom of the beam, the other is to the bottom of this, but the top of that beam. So we were, I mean, splitting hair in a sense uh, to come up with what might be the appropriate way to make these relationships and then go even higher. So why not just go right above it all, relate to the highest building and get many more reading rooms and what would that mean in terms of scale? And these are just schematic renderings, of course, it sort of developed, but just trying to study it from different vantage points of how it would look, how it would relate to the different buildings at, dif at different sort of moments, even from the interstitial space spaces, et cetera. And then, you know, based on those studies, also making sure the seating, the number of books, uh, the capacities, the seminar spaces, all worked uh, as an idea. So once we finished that, uh, then we really began to look at the design questions in terms of materiality, in terms of really articulating the spaces, uh, et cetera. And so these were the first models, which were schematic, which uh, defined the zones of the building, underground, overground, a roof that hovers, uh, and some kind of wall that sort of encloses. You see in these models how uh, we began to study the proportions, how much should this courtyard step back. Of course, a lot of this has changed and evolved and its relation to the existing buildings. In some places we were constrained, so we took the worst conditions. In other places the buildings are much further away, so those relationships are much easier to establish, but also seeing in more micro detail what might be the feeling of those spaces of bounce light, where you have this heavy container and light, but then you have a very light skin which is transparent, and the books are, you see the stacks there, there's a lot of transparency, and they're different heights, so you have staircases within the stacks which are very interesting. Uh, you know, where, I mean, at your age, I think love affairs will start in these places. So that really was the final kind of uh, spread. You had a second floor reading room. You had a first floor informal, formal reading room. This is what we have. Uh, then we have a ground floor exhibition and a reception. Uh, then you have a first basement, which is a book core and carols around it. So they're book stacks, but they're carols where people will spend a lot of time. So the idea of more natural light. Uh, then you have an intermediary basement core, which is a kind of mezzanine within the core because for stacks you only need eight feet. You don't need very high sort of volumes. Then you have a second basement and a formal reading and seminar spaces because here the foot 
footprint of the building becomes the whole length. The courtyard doesn't go all the way down to this level, but you have skylights instead. And we felt seminar rooms with skylights and things would be wonderful places uh, to use. And then you have the lower basement, the third basement, which is archive and, and storage. So sorry, so that becomes the components uh, of the building as we've arrived at at this moment. Uh, and then just going back to so this, the site plan and the integrity of that approach uh, stays the same. And then, of course, the question was studying this in detail, which is uh, what does it mean in relationship? And this is finally what we arrived at. There were many steps in between this, which I don't have the time to show you. There were many studies in different materials, concrete base, other kinds of facades. There were about three or four different entire studies. Um, and then finally, at the moment, we've arrived at this idea uh, in terms of relationships. So here, we've created a base which actually extends out beyond the upper building, which begins to hold uh, these lines. So when you're walking in this condition at the back, uh, you, there's a relationship and the building doesn't feel too bulky. Uh, but there it begins to relate at, in, on a long vista uh, to the highest buildings on the site. But we've always caught the bottom of the beam. So we've not, in respect, in a way, even if it's a token, we have not gone higher uh, than the existing buildings in any, in any condition. And this was really the toughest move, both for the committee and for for us to struggle through because you know the mass you see this mass in the master plan allowed a mass to be there and so to invert that was the biggest challenge to make it viable uh, and yet invert the mass in that way but for us it made sense because the reading rooms which are places where there are 80 people sitting there's a lot of students that you can see the green that from the plaza you see the transparency you see people reading there and the more quiet areas the areas where books temperature all of that has to be maintained for many other practical reasons all go below with nice bounced light and in the climate of Ahmedabad that's a kind of I, I think that's the appropriate response uh, because of the glare and things uh, that you have to deal with including the dust and stuff which I'll just come to and so those are just close-ups of those studies where you see a very clear setback here of what is suggested in brick as a base which also relates with a concrete band but that's actually a catwalk which allows the servicing of the facade, but it creates a setback that allows a more comfortable kind of uh, profile, so to speak, in the worst situation. In the other situations, the distances are so long that you won't feel that in so many sort of ways. And this is just now a walk through the building. You enter here, so this is almost a literal translation of the Anup Talab, and you'll see these courtyards down. So these are voids, you kind of look down, and the protection is massive, so one can actually make this very transparent and very light. Uh, and this is a large room which is over three meters wide, uh, which has sliding shutters, so you can open it up completely. It can be closed as rooms for two juries happening simultaneously. It can have a long table for a big conference, uh, but it can otherwise just have exhibitions there. So as you walk to the library, there are moments of repose all around here, including these sort of walls. These are going to be sliding partitions. Uh, so this can become an exhibition space uh, on books, on works of architects, parts of your archives, uh, and it can also be converted quite easily because these distances are like six meters. So this can easily become a place where four or five reviews can happen simultaneously on the ground floor of the building uh, and in a lot of transparency, which would be very nice. The thickness you see here is this is a concrete wall which goes down to create the profile as a retaining wall and there's a brick wall which is uh, 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 with a void and that above that becomes the catwalk so you also get the illusion of thickness it provides insulation naturally at least for those levels uh, and it allows these two materials to be negotiated uh, the concrete working better uh, as a solid monolithical material to create the structure because the structure gets integrated in that and the brick which gets uh, wrapped on the outside which relates not only as texture to the rest of the buildings but I think could be also, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think be demonstrative in the way it's made uh, by craftspeople and all of that. And those become, I mean, there are many sections because it's quite complex with many multiple levels within the stacks. But that section just basically gives you a sense of how uh, that happens. And that's a staircase, which I'll show you in plan in a second, which takes you up. So there are very interesting volumes within the volume at every level. So even within the stacks, there are double heights. There are double heights with uh, tables where people can study. So you don't go into three, four levels of stacks 
stacks and it's all small heights and you're looking at books, but you suddenly look down into volume. So everywhere, the volumetric dimension of the building, these are the skylights, these are volumes within the reading rooms. Uh, of course, the natural courtyard itself will be a volume. But that volumetric condition with all of these locking into each other, I think will create a sense of spaciousness, but it also will create eye contact between students in different spaces, which is nice. You don't want to be scared in the stacks you know, if you're going through them, which happens often. And so each facade on the base will be slightly different. It'll, the entrance will be similar, but the openings will be different, which will be based on what that facade is looking at or what you might frame from within the space. So there'll be slight differences. And then that's the facade, and you can just see that relation changing, and that's a model. Now, the big shift that has happened from the earlier schemes I showed you was we decided to extend the roof, and so to give not only more shade, but also to create a skin on the outer area for many reasons. One is we all felt that it would look more classic, it would be calmer, but it also will create a skin for the upper levels that, as in a tropical building somewhat, uh, for your monsoon times, also in the winter and summer, allow some control in that skin through shutters that can be operated easily. So the shutters within this sometimes can be open, sometimes can be closed. The north can be open all the time. The east and west can be closed. In a dust storm, they can be closed. In the heavy monsoon, they can be closed. So although the basements are designed with sumps and things to drain that water, this becomes one more level of, uh, of protection. But also, it diffuses light in interesting ways. And this is something we are yet developing because it's contingent on products available. You know, we don't want to be importing material. We are also exploring possibilities of color. If you're using polycarbonate, I'll show you that all in a minute. So it has a lot of potential. It also allows us, given the deadlines and things, to detach the facade in some ways in its detail from the operation of the building because a building like this also takes months of operation to set up. And so you know, we can stagger strategically uh, some of that time. So here you begin to start seeing in section the stacks. You see the courtyard goes down to that level. Here the skylights will bring light down, but this is just uh, stacks that are not accessible to students, where, but these are the archives where things are kept to be retrieved on demand. And what you've seen in the exhibition is that the one big difference, which we didn't have time to re-render, is that this is not going to be paved at all. This was before we got involved in the plaza, and I don't know why we assumed the plaza was going to be paved, and I'll show you in a minute how we are thinking about it, but this is how the building and the scale of the building in terms of how it will sit. When you enter the building, you would enter on a bridge, uh, and this is part of the courtyard. You see the upper levels. Uh, and this is the upper level, the first reading room for, on the first floor. Uh, and of course, this configuration might change. There might be carrels, but you see elevators, stair ac access everywhere. The services all come here. These steps of staircases, light staircases, take you up to the sky catwalk, so you can actually walk around the building uh, so the facade can be uh, serviced, cleaned, operated, uh, and it, it's just practical in its operation. And we are trying to do cross columns here so that it would look very light uh, and it would be different and that would be in metal. And the level above that, again, it's reading rooms. Maybe they can be carols. The glass sets back a little bit uh, for shade. Uh, but again, we've created an outdoor veranda, so you can actually go out there at that upper level. It's also secure in terms of books because it's up one more level, but it becomes a reading veranda under the shade in the good weather. That might be a good spot to do. So again, it's easy to move that glass forward, but we just felt to create a range of spaces, because different people are comfortable reading in different conditions at different times and different things, uh, that um, you know, if someone has to speak on their cell phone, maybe they go out. But uh, that's what sort of the model studies are, where you, you see these sort of entrances. And here, there's a bit of a service stack. So that's got uneven. But that works because it's very close to the facade, so it creates its own sort of relationships. Uh, and th that's the new model where you know we've begun to adjust for the volumes and the spaces and begin to introduce the columns uh, and uh, beginning to study how these sort of shafts would be. That's the bridge. There's more services at the back here, as you can see. These are the stacks with the skylights that bring light in here. So the stacks go down, 
both these flaws, but it's actually many levels of stacks within that. So that's a level of stack, that's one more level, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so there's more space uh, on the lower level. And then this is the first basement plan. So these are the double heights within the stacks, as I mentioned to you, and there's a kind of bridge that takes you to that part of the stacks and to this part of the stacks. And I'm not showing those drawings, but also the HVAC and all of that is integrated within these sort of areas. So none of that will be visible. And there's a whole zone for librarians here at this this level, because this is where the action will take place in terms of reference, in terms of the real work uh, of people in the library. These steps take you to those mezzanine levels. So this is just four, five, six steps. It's not like climbing a, a lot. And then these are also carols and things here. So you know, with the proximity to the library and people who are doing longer term research. And then these become courtyards you can step out to. So these are the skylights, uh, which might be glass blocks, or they might be glass skylights, we're not sure yet, but this is enough space here that someone can actually go out there and read, or a group can go out there and meet, uh, et cetera. So at that level, there are lots of kinds of spaces that one can use, and then the services continue to be here, and they're stacked quite evenly. Uh, and that's the bridge. There are many studies we are doing here. What should the nature of these stacks be? You might see skylights. These are yet quite schematic. There are other options of other materials to use. And these are how the stacks would be. So they don't align with the flaws. They'll be intermediary kind of levels. And you'll see carrels. And these can be closed. So you have privacy because you also have glass on the other side. Uh, and then you go to the intermediary basement, which is this. Uh, it's like a mezzanine, and in the double height space, you have these tables where people can read and things in a much greater volume, so you don't feel claustrophobic. But there are also other volumes which are more intimate. And then, of course, these are just the cutouts uh, above. And then this is the second basement where light comes in through. These are all the skylights that you see here. So all these walls will be washed with a lot of light coming from above. And these become places for very large uh, working tables. There are smaller meeting rooms which will be closed off by glass. Uh, there are things for archives, for photocopying. There's a lot of requirements that have been uh, fitted in here based on, on the brief. But you yet will have a sense of openness. It will not feel claustrophobic. This was a scheme where we had smaller skylights skylights, but now we're doing continuous skylights there, because it's never direct sun, so you'll get a wash on that light. But there'll be a sense of lightness uh, through these stacks, going all the way down these uh, levels, and then these are the long tables where uh, students can uh, work. And then this is the third uh, basement plan, which are really stacked uh, uh, storage sort of uh, areas. And then you see it in the model here. The facade details are the ones that are now being worked on uh, as we speak, literally, because there are lots of options there. Uh, how to keep the transparency of this, but yet create protection. What should the rhythm of these columns be in the model? They look very close, but they're not so close. I think we're trying to show shutters here. Uh, but all of that changes. And then the studies at the back is what we are doing, where you know that same vocabulary of the beam and the uh, brickwork is caught here. This sets back. This is the catwalk. Those are the staircases that take you up to the catwalk to service some of this uh, when required. There's also a catwalk for the upper level, but that catwalk is inside. So it also becomes a brow uh, for, for that in terms of light and things. So for, for that catwalk, you approach it from above, and the catwalk is inside, so it doesn't spoil the integrity of the facade. But for the lower part of the facade, the catwalk is here, which allows people to reach this, to service it, to change it, to clean it to operate it, et cetera. So these are also being studied and fine-tuned. And now, as we look at the plaza and we look at the paving by just manipulating levels and things, how we tie all this together, I think we'll begin to get fine-tuned. So just to sort of remind you, those become really the components uh, of the building. Now, this part of the presentation is all things very much in progress, but one is just in the spirit of the way we've organized this meeting is to really you know, just share with you at least things we've been thinking about. So these are the kinds of things we've looked at, maybe even zinc, uh, expanded metal. What will that do? Will that cut out the water and the dust or not? So we are exploring that as an option. What should the size of that expanded and pattern of that be? Should that be only on the top and something else at the bottom? Should there be two different patterns? Uh, should it be polycarbonate maybe on the lower level uh, or reverse it the other way? Or should it be one material on the whole facade? What are the different kinds of polycarbonates we can get? What is the detail of the shutter? So that's all happening. We'll, I think, with the committee now, move into doing
doing mock-ups and seeing how they operate, get consulting from industrial designers, because we also, all of us imagine this building as any of you would. It should also be a learning building that there are details. Sometimes you might do details just because they become educational details uh, in a sense that it should also demonstrate different ways of doing things, which is what I recall with these great buildings. So that brick wall that they ran out of money not to plaster and the hinges they didn't put, for me, were actually amazingly, it opens your mind to all sorts of other possibilities, which then, as students in your future careers, you expand on. So the idea is to really embrace new materials to look at it, even the roof, we're exploring a zinc roof, uh, the clay bricks, what is the bonds that we should use, we're kind of exploring all of that, should it be different bonds on different facades, so it also becomes a catalog of bonds, what is the nature of the material we use, so we are exploring all of that um, uh, at the moment, should it be like Alvar Alto's experimental house, which was literally an experiment of the different ways of bonding uh, brick and different materials of brick, uh, should we be looking to Laurie Baker for inspiration, should it also have porosity, so I mean I think there are just many interesting questions that we are all facing and we are discussing and we are at the stage where we are beginning to embrace these questions in interesting ways. Uh, for these reveals we were wondering whether with the ex exposed brick or weathered steel might be a nice uh, material to bring in there uh, because it picks up the textures but it also doesn't reflect um, you know and wood there will weather quite badly. Uh, also the finishes uh, you know, concrete, which is a wax finish concrete, could that sort of come on these walls? Should that come on that external courtyard floor? Those are options. Cork for the exhibition surfaces. Uh, in this entrance area, including around the reception, uh, because that is the librarian's areas for checking out books, for leaving bags, so there's a lot of storage, but that also gives us surfaces which can become exhibition surfaces. So is cork a good material to do there? Um, then using wood minimally, just in the carrels in one or two places, because it's an expensive material, but it does bring warmth, uh, and how do we balance that? Uh, and also quota stone, naturally, on some of the levels would be a very good material to use. Korean for the wet zones, how you mold it. So we've identified and made catalogs of all of this. Now the last part, which I think I, for the first time we're even talking about it, this was something we just made some drawings to think about it, which we've finished literally, uh, I would say, a day or two ago, uh, just to, uh, you know, after Bimal's sort of brief, because essentially what happened was we began to do uh, the building, and then we began to not know how to deal with the adjacencies. We didn't even know what levels to establish, because should we take, they want to take the plinth higher, but then what would it mean with relationship to steps everywhere else? So it, it just, the decisions led uh, with the committee, led them to tell us, look, just detail it so that at least the building can be established, and of course it can be modified. Uh, as we know better. So we began to look at it. I go back to this uh, because this is an important question. Uh, I mean, at the level of the building, the question, the important question becomes the mass of the building, just in summary of the last part, and uh, it becomes a mass of the building. It also becomes the treatment of what is below and the treatment of what is above. Uh, obviously, clearly the treatment what is below is a direct response to a hot, dry climate. The treatment above, I believe, works for both a hot, dry climate because we have enough volume in the roof to insulate, but we also have expansive shading. Uh, but it also works in a humid condition, which is also months of humidity that we experience in a place like Ahmedabad. So it begins to do both things, and it is going to be an air-conditioned volume, because I know the school is committed to make that very comfortable, even in the summer. And so that's what I mean by passivity, that just by shading it, not doing blinds and reflective glass, you get the sense of transparency and the beauty of looking around in the campus, but you also, with like four meters of shade uh, and a layer of, uh, of, of, of a facade surface can actually deal with both those conditions. So that's sort of what led us to make those decisions. Now at the level of the site plan, it's this question of what is, uh, I mean, at least I haven't been able to read uh, what is the implicit code in this. Uh, uh, and like I said, I see very clearly uh, incredible integrity here. And one can also imagine this building expanded there, those exposed beams that you see. And that gives you a fantastic armature, which really, for the entrance and things, holds the campus. And you kind of come in through the staircase, and a whole new world opens out here, which are these many fragments. Because you know uh, some of these 
these buildings follow that style, but uh, I'll be candid, they don't perform as well as these buildings perform, just because in the way they were dealt with sectionally and things like that, for various reasons. Uh, it's not a criticism, but it's just a reflection. And then, of course, the Visual Arts Center is a completely different story, so is the Gufa, so are all these fragments here. So, you know, where, where does one start? And I think at the site level, therefore, the plaza becomes very important, and rightly so, they pushed us to, we were very hesitant first, and we said master plan, and there's a master plan, and, but it just seemed like the building could be the trigger to start seeing how we can organize ourselves on the site planning. And so we've got into that. Uh, and then one fragment that is really an important one to discuss, at least for me, there's deep nostalgia, having made six wooden models there and almost lost your finger a couple of times, um, that what happens with that workshop, which was a site, um, uh, a site office. So, yes, one could we could be collectively incredibly nostalgic about it. I mean, uh, you know, for example, recently Jeff uh, uh, Jeff uh, Jeb Bergman uh, wrote this wonderful piece, uh, which I often share with my students. He wrote a piece where he took all the norms or all the criteria for World Heritage Site listing, every criteria, and then he showed how Dharavi meets each one of those. Uh, unique settlement, unique material, represented a particular era, et cetera. So this whole thing about the nostalgia and conservation, a lot of us are involved in it. The question is how far do you stretch it? And really the real big question is what are the trade-offs? Is that if that nostalgia is helping one slow down the pace of change and in a productive way that we as activists band around and stop something from being erased, it's one thing. If it stops us from improving something for much larger public good, then that's a problem. Then how do you establish the memory? How do you keep it? Become interesting questions. I don't know the answer, but I know this, and I'll say this, being a student here, being, having made six wooden models there, having been very nostalgic about it, is this is a piece that we have to really think about hard. Uh, whether we remove it, keep a memory of the plinth and create seating there that people can tell stories about the workshop that existed, I don't know. But uh, we can't be overly nostalgic about it if we have to be ambitious and think of a campus that has 1,000 or 2,000 students eventually and five faculties or six faculty and you know all of that. That fragment, being someone who is engaged deeply in conservation, I think is, no, problematic is not the right word, but it needs debate, it needs to be, it, it, it should be an option that we should discuss of how it can be displaced, removed, and its memory maintained in some other way. But these other fragments, as you can see in this plan, it's a really hard question. And so, uh, for right now, it seems the Visual Arts Center Again, is another story and another animal in a sense, both architecturally but also in terms of its own administrative, legal uh, kind of condition. And so if one has to bind this plaza together or create something of it, I'm assuming that this armature extends, then these become the fragments that we can address at the moment in terms of trying to create coherence. And of course, we looked at Google and that kind of, you know, I mean, because of the trees, because of these fragments are not visible. But you see this as, um, you know, a, a muddy path there, which I know for all the Garba enthusiasts is like the most important space. Uh, but uh, again, how can we make both happen becomes the big question. And so we went back to looking at, you know, what might be the organization on it. Is there, are there any lines we can discern? We put the footprint of our own building, which we realized is large. I mean, the actual footprint of the building is much smaller. This is the perimeter of what we are creating as the skin. So we began to put them all in. We began to indicate the volumetric kind of conditions. So you begin to start seeing what's happening. And it seems very clear that, or at least for us at this first stage, is if this recedes in some way, I don't think we should lose its memory completely, but I think it could become a plinth, it could become something, that we begin to get a very clear definition here, allowing this armature to extend, because that could be a very, whatever happens, whether you extend the building as is, or you build another building eventually, which is compatible with that, but it would create an amazing edge here in some way eventually to create a sense of this plaza and the library there. The library is actually, as you can see, much smaller. It's, the footprint is big. 
It's only the void footprint that's big. The actual building footprint is much smaller. And of course, there's a lot of self-built things here which are very interesting. And I think what the, uh, the, what the library building will eventually do is actually make that into a more contained courtyard, which it already is because there is a building there, but only eight feet high or nine feet high. But I think this could be another world, which is a nice contrast. There's a kind of informality here. There's an organic quality here. There's a life cycle of these materials which might change things might be built by students, and then you have a formality here, which is what holds uh, the, the, the campus together. So this is sort of uh, our studies to show how one can actually capture a plinth here. So this building extends out to something which allows outdoor events, but also becomes uh, a, a space for that facade to relate to. Uh, and then you create big stairs here. Uh, a cafeteria potentially here could be a really good position because um, it, can, it can actually open out on this side. It can be more a blank wall here, which becomes a backdrop for many things. What you see here is all unpaved. We feel that a large chunk can be left unpaved if you begin to pave parts of the perimeter to create circulation that goes up and down, because here you have a much higher plinth. You can come down, go up again. Uh, and then uh, similarly here, whether it's steps that go down like this into what might be another sub-plaza, uh, which because here the levels fall a lot, so then you begin to start getting a series of spaces, uh, some which are paved, some which are totally unpaved, this is totally unpaved, this is totally unpaved. So you minimize the paving to create circulation because in the monsoon I know it's a problem. You go into these sort of muddy puddles, leave your slipper behind and all of that. Uh, so you actually get a good balance then perhaps of what, and then one way to tie this up is also negotiate these levels. So you begin to then get another kind of geometry which is organic, but the main thing is it begins to define different spaces which are all at the same level somewhat, uh, but they are textured differently in terms of their finishes. Uh, so those become places that allow for green. This could be paved or not paved because there's a lot of unpaved here. That is totally unpaved, so it could be yet used. I mean, we'll have to study the garba dimensions and the ideal circle size and all of that. Uh, but uh, we, we are mindful of that for sure. And then you create something of a low-key building here, so it doesn't disturb that, but it commands a space and a connection to different parts of the campus, which could be a building uh, which uh, can house some of these facilities. It can also be one of those buildings that are a shorter life cycle. Uh, they can also open out in that direction, keep that more blank. I don't know. These are, like I said, we haven't even shown it to the committee. We have to get their feedback. But we just took this leap of faith and said we should uh, actually share it because some inputs might actually be productive uh, and we can talk about it. And one of the things that we've tried to do is to keep that access very, because you know, one, I started with that slide. That's the building that one prizes and that moment one prizes as the the heart of the campus in some ways. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of its original significance, let's say, because now there are many other parts that have become important and have multiple associations all over. But that's an important uh, sort of uh, bit. And so just to create that actuality, we thought some of this could be paved because then this space between these three buildings also becomes of an other scale, but in an important gathering area. One of the briefs we were given also is how do you organize convocations? Uh, and what's nice about, I think, the way we've organized this is the convocation can use multiple buildings as backdrops. If it uses this building as backdrops, you have, we've done drawings which I have not shown and how you can accommodate a few thousand people sitting here and circulation going up to receive your degree and coming down. You can use that building as a backdrop. I think there are many, many possibilities. So the garba, the convocation, the big gatherings is what now we will have to run kind of uh, uh, tests and trying to draw them out to see if it works uh, for all uh, situations. And so that with the existing trees, we've sort of, you can see the existing trees here as another layer. So you get a sense of how one has um, responded to the green spaces, why that green space has been kept, why within this paved area you can have seating around uh, these trees, but you can also have seating on the plinth of this, which could be the memory of the old workshop. And so wherever you see our green patches, it all often has to do with the fact that they are existing trees and using that as a way to inform the structure of what might be the plaza. And like I said, this, this partly will be paved here, but this is all unpaved, so there's a lot of uh, unpaved uh, area. And really, um, just to summarize, I mean, that's the end. I'm happy to 
take questions, take feedback. Uh, uh, is just to repeat what I said, one, I think one big challenge was really taking the master plan, uh, taking the volume that was uh, decided in the master plan, uh, and then with Christopher's consensus, but also with the committee's consensus, actually sinking it in the ground so that we don't go, we respect the height of the campus because I think that is very important. An extension of that thought is the notion that this campus is, I mean, for me personally, for all of us, an important piece of architecture which must be respected in as much as we can. Uh, and therefore, I think volumetrically, we didn't want to disturb it at all. An extension of that was then the challenge of, uh, you know, what is the grain of this thing, so to speak, on the given campus. Uh, and that took a long time to actually conclude, I would say confidently, that there isn't a given grain. There's one corner where you could imagine a very clear idea of what was coming because you know, the architect who did the campus himself fractured and fragmented it for good reasons. One is to experiment with new ideas in architecture, which is incredibly important for learning for students, but also constraints of costs, constraints of the identity of the different players who came on the campus, like the Kanoria Art Center, the, the Gufa, all of that. So there was a question of identity there. And so I think what we are trying to do, or at least aspiring to try to do, is to straddle those multiple identities but yet reinforce the overall identity of the campus in the choices of materials, in respecting the height, uh, et cetera. And then coming from that is the detail of what should the facade be, especially what's above ground, what's below ground. Of course, they are pragmatic responses, but, uh, and of course, questions of transparencies which are needed. But above ground, uh, we felt something that can straddle both the hot, dry, as well as a humid climate, but also create a new expression and create an expression which is dynamic because once you have a transparency like this, you have to imagine this building in the day and in the night because the library is something that's used at the night and so we felt this kind of expression also makes it a lantern that sits in the middle of the plaza and the campus that glows at night and therefore implicitly also or explicitly also attracts students to it like flies to lights. Uh, so, uh, so that was uh, the, the, uh, the other thing. The plaza is very preliminary. It is, I've been listening to conversations with the committee and there have been many, many interesting discussions on how do you hold a campus together, and the, doing the building itself and trying to make it implicitly structure the campus was one thing and at some point Bimal said, you're not gonna get very far from that, just go ahead and start telling us what are the lines of the plaza. So that's why we did that, both to get the levels for our building right, but also to see what are the possibilities of how little things of level steps uh, paved surfaces, open surfaces, taking the existing trees into account can all add up in a coherent way to give this campus a coherence because I think in spirit and in culture it has an amazing coherence. At the leadership level it has an amazing coherence. It's just that because it got incrementally built it got very fragmented in terms of its design uh, and I think it's up to our generation to pull it back to make it a uh, well, it is a wonderful place to make it an even better place. Thanks very much. Questions? Your name and your code number so I know which year you're in. <laughs> Another format for questions. Nimish, of course. This no is question. I, what I saw three months ago, which was on... Uh, yeah, somewhere. Not in the exhibition, but somewhere. Facebook, right? It was uh, literally a cause of concern for me about the continuity and desirable change being blended with each other. I am completely relieved today to say. I'm relieved, Nimish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, like you said very clearly that this has something right here. And it occupies a very large space, this campus right here. And that is very sacrosanct for us. One issue I would suggest you keep in mind is that in this kind of climate, our sky component is extremely high. And therefore, even if we have lots of natural light, we have to be very concerned with glare. Yeah. That's all that, uh, yeah. I need to say. Yeah. I, I, that's why the choice of the material of that skin is going to be important. And therefore, we are looking 
at one end with that perforated, with, which will shade it. Or, you see, we, that's what we are studying right now. Yeah. And about the campus, hmm. I think the first time I see this as being a cohesive campus in hmm. its seed. Hmm. And thank you and congratulations. Thanks, Namish. Thank you very much. Why can't we go beyond to become the tallest building on campus? Well, we leave that for Dubai and Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, no, 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 I mean, you could, yeah, absolutely, no, no, I think it was a valid question. We, we started, the master plan actually even suggested that, that it becomes an icon by going vertical. And I, I tell you really, and I'm not exaggerating, and this is what I enjoyed and I respect and I'm thankful for to the committee, is it was an open dialogue. We had, I can't tell you how many dialogues about how high. I only showed you a few images of those studies. We did many studies like that to show the impact of it. And you know, it's a question of scale, and scale has to do with adjacency. So, um, you know, and so we've taken the worst situation to make the scale work there. Because those are buildings that are going to last. And you know, all these buildings, whether it's SID, others, we are saying their problems is this, that, and the other. But these are buildings we are, all, we are going to all fight for to keep. And so you have to respect them. And I think scale building in any historic uh, environment, you can do a glass clad building. But the scale, if you maintain, half the job is done. And I think the scale is what respects an environment. Uh, because um, it's the texture. So even in this very fragmented environment or campus, I think the one thing is the scale is what we all enjoy and benefit. And as our cities disrespect that scale more and more, uh, I think on an architecture school campus, the scale of intimacy, of uh, you know, people being able to connect to each other, it's important. When you go into those high-rise kind of conditions, even if it's six or seven sto stories, you separate people by default. Uh, and so I think uh, that was, I mean, we spent our first few months just discussing that. And I shared a few studies with you. So of course it can go high, but uh, we don't need to, I think. But this is, I mean, we can argue this uh, till the cows come home. Parul. So much of glass still bothers me a lot. In this, uh, you know, we are almost reaching 47, 48 degrees, and the predictions are that we'll reach 50 degrees in a few years' time. So, you know, you need a screen, even the overhangs are not going to be that useful. And there was a joke always, uh, you know, in Cambridge area in 70s that most of the fees that Harvard got were spent in okay. beating up uh, <coughs> the design of the school, right. Harvard uh, graduate design school, yeah. because of the glass and you had to really cool that much huge, uh, heat up that space. And I see that problem here. No, no, I think, I think that's a very good question and a legitimate concern for all of us. Uh, I, 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 at least I believe right now that the overhangs, the double screen, the whatever sun studies we've done schematically, we haven't modeled it in any way. Maybe we should do that. You know, if you keep the sun away from the surface of the glass, a lot of that problem is solved. Uh, then it's the volume of air that is adjacent to it. And we feel there's enough circulation in just in the way that void has been created. But I think as we go into the detailing of the interior, I can myself see areas where that will disappear, uh, where the carrels will come, there'll be partitions. We are also thinking of more exhibition spaces at the lower level, so you might have sliding shutters and not have glass necessarily. So the first thing we've done is at least make sure the sun doesn't touch the glass directly anywhere, and there's always a void of air which will naturally get heated up, but it'll at least move. Uh, so hopefully that we explored in the early designs, even a water spray system, a sprinkler system, other forms of cooling it. But then I think we all agreed that you know those are that need different organizations to maintain and things like that. So we, but you know these are all very useful things. It just reminds us of our concerns which have got suppressed, and now we'll surface them. So thank you. That's a good contribution. Uh, Rahul, my concern is uh, not, I, in fact, I quite enjoyed the inside of the building and the way that you, you described it and the views. My concern is still the relationship with the existing campus. And uh, actually, I'm 
I was very surprised that you keep referring to the campus as fragmented because my as as fragmented. Huh. Uh, and uh, your initial drawings were really of the block, but when you the last few drawings that you showed where you're showing the actual plans, uh, I, I felt that the the idea that it, or the experience of spaces on the campus is my own has not been one of fragmentation because I've always thought of the open spaces as being the uh, the centers around which various configurations take place. And in spite of uh, uh, varying footprints, as you called it, uh, surrounding, because there were open spaces which, which kind of anchored or structured the plan, um, there was a continuity, there was, there is a kind of coherence to it. Uh, but there's also a language that comes out of making the the, s the open space as uh, uh, as a center. There's a the, the buildings have canopies or large double height spaces which front them, and there's a sequence from those open spaces into the building. I was curious about how you were thinking about uh, these things because I mean, I, on one hand, one of the things that which uh, concerns me is the way that you actually enter the building. It seems almost uh, a, a fenestration through which you enter rather than say a space, which is. Uh, something that one would expect on the campus, given its present language. I'm just, uh, I'm just curious how you think about. It. So you, I, I think you've got two questions. So we we'll, let's separate them. Uh, one is your concern, which I have to yet understand. Uh, the other is the sequence of spaces and things. And absolutely, I mean, totally. I mean, I think what we've all learned as students of architecture here is that beautiful sequence of spaces suddenly becoming double heights, and you come to the north light and. Now, you know, my own reading of that is for, stu see, studios are soft spaces. You can arrange them, rearrange them. Sometimes the studios are 10 people, sometimes they're 20. So spaces like this work, they are robust as an armature for that kind of thing. But when you get into programs, that's the reason why the library has all sorts of problems in that same space, you have to retrofit it. The programmatic requirements for a library are so precise uh, in terms of, well, books, uh, hierarchy of books, uh, the number of seats, how specifically there's a hierarchy, informal, formal, carols, librarians. You suddenly begin, it's like hospitals are one extreme of that, so we land up getting machines. Uh, a library also, in at least studying all the precedents we did, um, between the volume of books as a requirement of bulk and all the support requirements, it's actually very precise, which means you have to, f I think you have to, create an expression of that precision in some ways. Uh, so whether it's the entrance, whether it's the hierarchy of spaces. And I believe that the, what we have learned here and therefore even within the stacks to create volumes, I think we've tried to within that volumetrically manipulate it as much as we can and I hope it will evolve even further, both in terms of the way the shell takes the building into it uh, as well as within the building. So I mean, I think, uh, uh, while one admires that in these existing buildings, one also recognizes that I think these buildings work brilliantly for what they do uh, as studio spaces, as classrooms, sitting in that basement on benches with 20 students, you know, the, with, on a chalkboard without slide projection, without this. It worked absolutely. Maybe life should have continued to be like that rather than get caught up with all this digital stuff and things. But given that, if one accepts that, then they, they are programmatic and other pragmatic requirements which need another level of precision. So then the challenge becomes to the architect. Within that, you could easily make a diagram which is much more schematic, which is what invariably happens with hospitals very easily because everyone else determines the spatial qualities. And in a library, it's actually quite close. Uh, in you see a lot of modern libraries. So I think my response to the spatial, that's how I think about it, which is what you asked. I mean, I think you were just posing it as a way of thing. But the, the other one of the, the concern was about the spatial thing or the concern was about the facade? Uh, well, very simply to put it was then architecturally, how do you see the building not becoming just another fragment, but as you were saying, becoming something that ties the campus together. So that, that was my concern. I mean, I've yeah. seen how it comes. Correct. Together. So there are two ways of addressing that concern. One is we look at the master plan from scratch and begin to see what might be the spots you do what, which I don't think, uh, I, I think it's too contested to do that. That's the reality. So 
let's say I've been pragmatic, pragmatic and I've accepted that reality that I, you know, I, I otherwise would say knock the visual arts center, put this there, put that there. I wish I could do that, but obviously one can't. That would open up many possibilities. Given the constraints of those contestations, and I think that's why quite logically the discussion has moved to the plaza and trying to imagine the other fragments for exactly that reason. That is, you could do a fragment and it'll stay a fragment. But if we can begin to manipulate the levels, the paved, non-paved areas, try to make the space for where, uh, without designing them to suggest where other things would come. So even that cafeteria, I, I'm not, I mean, you know, that's not the design. We're just suggesting that's a place it can come, where you can begin to then, I think in an economical way, because it's not a huge investment of resources, begin to create a coherence through manipulating the ground plane on which all these fragments sit, because you have no control on the fragments right now. And related to that, I mean, I think your interesting observation about that each of these fragments command space around them, and that you could read as the character as we do when we look at traditional rural or urban environments. So that, that's a reading, but uh, the, the question is, it's, I mean, the, 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 the truth is, it's, it's, it's organically and incrementally become that. Now, do we want to, that's a broader, broader aspirational question for us as a community. Do we want to extend that? And that's why I started by saying one option would have been to extend exactly that, because that's my reading, is to do a fragmented library, do seven little locations. Some is a reading room, some is a seminar room, to reinforce exactly what you're saying. But then I don't, I, as an architect, didn't read that as the aspiration of the institute. And uh, so if I have to say my client's aspiration is different, I can slip between the two groups. Um, uh, I think that's worth respecting, and I think the scale of this institution, the complexity of this institution, given different faculty, uh, what it's, it's, it's aspiring to be. Uh, I think the fragmented approach perhaps is not uh, both administratively and otherwise the right way uh, to go. So one accepted those constraints, but not without engaging with this group, which is why it's nice to know people and for their openness uh, to engage with it. And some things they convinced us about, some things we convinced them about. So strategically, we, we, you know, once they let us, once we, once we allowed to accept the fact that we were going to do that footprint there, then the next thing that they sort of came and met us on was taking it below the ground to not let it go high. So these are the kinds of trade-offs, as in any project that occur through the process. And I think everything you're saying I'm sorry I'm being so long-winded, but everything you're saying were things that were discussed, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly. So thank you for surfacing it, because it's useful. It's useful for the discussion, because I mean, I think part of what we are doing today is trying to create a forum also for that discussion, because the blogs and all of that is chatter, which sometimes is not productive. It's useful, but not productive. A consideration in bringing that uh, coherence. Uh, you mean no, just no, trying to use the architectural no, language? Not necessarily, literally using the the the, the language that is existing. Yes. But making uh, more direct references to the existing language. Actually, you know, uh, now th this is where in architecture you cross that line into total subjectivity. And at this point, actually, I think I'm making all the references directly to those materials and the things. So this is where the discussion can become subjective. Uh, and, you know, one respects different views on it, yeah. I think Kushru Kalyaniwala had a question, no? Kushru. Hi, I, I'm Nikunj from 2005 batch. Architecture. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, when we saw the presentation, even there were a lot of discussions earlier on Facebook. And, yeah. uh, so when we look at the plan of the building, the entire plan, it is uh, well worked out in terms of its core. And uh, so the, the basic diagram of the building, we have a core and the skin. And in between is the play of light. So I have three major points. Uh, ask one is the I have a question about the introvertness of the building and, uh, and we have also studied a lot of buildings in our uh, when we were studying in school of architecture still these days there are a few quotes that uh, you take a book and go towards light does this building offer any kind of uh, uh, 
you know, I mean, can you come out of that introvertness of this place in this building? Second question, Second question is, uh, as we discussed even the height of the building, now if we look at it climatically, you stay on the ground and you go on the upper floors, there's a kind of a breeze and of course there's a huge ground in front. So even if we study the microclimate of the space, the kind of wind that you can catch and talk about such experimental passive cooling systems and all. Because as we see this building, I mean, imagine this building when there is no electricity in the campus. And what happens then? So, I, I mean, Navi is architecture so much dependent upon the electricity. I mean, what does it have to do with the, you know, because we are always talking about the architecture being the I'll forget your question, so let me answer the first two because they're getting very long. Okay, so uh, actually I've forgotten the first one now already. Uh, no, you talked about the, uh, the introvertness, yeah. So I think your two questions, sorry to interrupt you, but they're sort of related because I do believe the top of the building is not introverted because once you have those things, we are showing you renderings with these shutters, it's going to be in fact completely transparent and it's going to engage with the outside. It is a library, so I mean, you know, if you want to be extroverted, you can read under the tree also once we do the plazas and the seats and things. But the building itself will be, the three levels of the building will be very visible, the upper levels, which is where a bulk of the people will read. The second, and so it's partly extroverted, partly introverted, at least visually, because library again has things about security of books. This. The climatic thing also, therefore the top, is those are not fixed glass shutters. Parul also I wanted to just mention, those are all openable, which means the air can go through, and those are the areas you can let the air go through. But the rest is all, with the air also comes a lot of dust in Ahmedabad, and that's not very good for books and for computers and things like that. And so therefore where all the more, um, precious or more uh, sensitive equipment and things is, is on the lower levels. Talking about then electricity, well, if it's at night, whatever the building is, you're going to not be able to solve the problem. But during the day, that's why we've got those general skylights and bounce light. This whole building without electricity, you'll be able to read, I mean, much more clearly than in a room like this. It's going to have much larger quantums of light. So except for the lowest basement, which is where there just stacks that roll, everything else is totally naturally lit. And therefore, I think Nimish's point and uh, is something we have to you know, really calibrate is at what point does it cut glare and give you enough light which is bounced or does the light become a disturbance is what you were asking. And glare is psychologically also makes you feel much hotter. So those are the balances. But I don't think there's a problem with light at all. Third question now. Yeah, so, uh, one thing is uh, about discussing the skin again in details. I mean, not right here, but as a design. Because that is something uh, the score is very well designed, even uh, the way you describe the entire thing. But the skin is something uh, that is actually holding a very good relationship with the entire language of the entire campus. And uh, I don't know, it, is it possible to really re-look at the skin? Because that, that is where the physical uh, uh, connections are also going yeah. to important yeah. uh, I mean, there's no question of re-looking at the skin because we're yet looking at the skin. So, you know, at some point, I suppose we'll either exhibit or we'll do another presentation or we'll actually, I think what we're going to really do, which is Bimal's suggestion, is to have mock-ups. We're going to actually have full-scale mock-ups and then look at it critically and then we can have another discussion like this around the mock-ups because, like I said, this, what's going to come in those infills is it doesn't stop the operation of the building. So we are going to take our time to get that right because I think everything you point out is very, very important. And we have seen a lot of failures. I mean, the uh, Indology is one of the, the, because it got flooded completely once. Same, similar thing happened to the uh, High Court Library. And the basement, yeah. Everything so gets flooded sometimes, yeah. No, even it, I mean, just related no, to no, no, yeah, no, 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 we are worrying about it. We've done detailed calculations. There are pits. Right. Yeah, then. Humidity and the way it affects the 
Right, right. but see, that's the. So this is not an underground building as you imagine it. You see those courtyards. I mean, it's it's there's space. I mean, those courtyards are as wide as this with light coming in. That's why there's a big disparity between the footprint of that outer wall and the inner core. So it's 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 not underground in that, except for that last one, which will be you know where the the rolling things will be in this thing. There nothing else is underground in that sense. Um, the last two are, but the upper three levels of the stacks and things have courtyards surrounding them. And that gives us the opportunity to create sumps to be able to take the water out and, and all of that. And one reason we added the skin, so the water table is not a problem. We can also capture it outside. The one reason we extended the roof into the skin, one is we felt that the enclosure, going back to the architectural question of the presence and relating to the campus, we just felt uh, uh, a roof that hovered was just not in character with anything. And so bringing the skin down uh, made it a much more contained volume, albeit very transparent, but also from a performance way because Bimal himself as chair of the committee was he started almost every meeting asking me that tell me about the rain and what will happen and if someone is we're closed all night and it pours that one night what happens etc and so that's something we are trying our best to address and I believe just because the way the sectional volume has been articulated that's taken care of a lot of things including the heating of the building the glass and all of that and of course we are nowhere close to being happy with what the skin should actually be uh, for both the reasons of our architectural articulation and reference to materials or tearing away from the reference to materials as the counter argument or the performative aspect. So this we are struggling with ourselves to be quite honest. No. Hello. Just as a trend, what I've been observing over the past five years that I've been here is that uh, all the double height volumes that have been existing in the school become canvases for installations or any kind of a student activity interact with the buildings that's been right. there. So with the and like the architecture basement just had these uh, small uh, slits in the beams which would you know always facilitate that kind of an approach. Yeah. So the kind of double height volumes that are coming in the library would they have such uh, suggestions in details which would kind of Correct. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, you could, but the question is, yeah, I mean, the, you could. The question is, I mean, every building doesn't need to do that. No, I mean, like I said, the library also programmatically is more sensitive for various reasons. And I mean, if you're going to build up a library with equipment, with media, with three times the number of books that you have, um, you also have to be careful about, you know, restricting it. It also, I mean, it goes back to that too. I mean, they, they, I mean there's a lot of value in imagining this kind of thing that occurs in these buildings existing everywhere and yes we've tried to as much as possible respond to that naturally but within the limits of the programmatic constraints of a library so I mean you have to also be aware of that you know so it's it's in fact for me uh, being a student here and for all of us of course the natural thing is trying to see what from this building we can extend but you have to also remind yourself that now there's so much precision in the requirements of a library that uh, you know, and uh, and Professor Snail Shah is in charge of that committee, so it's not uh, easy. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, in the previous question, you talked about the height and respecting what is uh, there. Uh, also, while uh, designing the site plan, you talked about that. So, uh, I, uh, about the overall site plan and the school workshop. Uh, Yeah, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, you're totally right, and that's why I said th these are the questions that we have to. Uh, d then eventually, it's a question of trade-offs, no? So, what are you gaining by that? What are you not gaining by that? Uh, some things are more tangible, some things are more intangible. 
so I think it's a discussion. I, I just wanted to prepare the ground or I wanted to throw that question on because I know even as a st if I wasn't involved in trying to do this, I would also be one who would be saying, why well, workshop, leave it, we've all got used to it and it's important historically. But now one thinks about as one is drawing there and seeing possibilities that if it, di it didn't exist and you made it a kind of intangible thing where you had a, uh, uh, or you made it tangible in another way that you had a plinth and there were memories of it and people talked about it and at some point those memories would fade as people don't carry on that oral tradition. That's interesting. Uh, uh, so I just want to put that question out that I don't think, I don't think we should be dogmatic about it. I think we need to articulate our own position on what the trade-offs are. What is it doing for us? Is it maybe it's reminding us that little fragment is reminding us about, you know, incremental settlements and what all the rest of our city live, looks like, and we don't get carried away by this formality of the campus. Maybe that's something that's good, which is what you're alluding to in a different way. Uh, you know, it reminds you of another kind of scale and things like that. But then if it means that is going to disrupt wonderful rhythms that occur through the building as you come up, especially if this armature is important and everything else is fragments and it restricts what can happen on the plaza when you're now you're so many students, then, then that's a question for discussion. So I think we should, I mean, I would just end my response to that question by saying, I think we have to be open. At least I've got to the position personally that we have to be very open uh, about what we do with that. Uh, I would have been much more dogmatic uh, maybe even a year ago. Um, but uh, I just have reached a position where I feel that uh, it could open up some interesting possibilities. But I very much respect what you're saying uh, in terms of what we should remind ourselves about within the discussion about scale or nostalgia or whatever, references of older fragments on the campus. <laughs> so this library block, you mean what would happen once the library moved, you're asking? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you could have one more studio there. You could have, I mean, again, going back to the earlier discussion, these are very robust and beautiful spaces. So once the library moves, it means you just have one more space to do the installations, to do studios, to have classes. It just, it becomes part of, uh, it becomes part of the continuum of what exists on the campus. I mean, that's what I would uh, say, uh, I think, no? <laughs> what do you think should happen? Come on now, you have to participate. Maybe the workshop should come in there, okay. okay. With that, may I request uh, Dr. Bimal Patel to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. So thank you very much, Rahul. I also want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who is working to make this library possible, all the different people who are involved in making it possible, designing it right now. So thanks to everybody, including the trustees and the board of management, etc. I want also to remind you, I'm, I'm personally really looking forward to this library being built and seeing it done fast so that we can start using it. I, I, hope you people are also looking forward to it. Um, as we build it in one year, it's going to mean a, a bit of disruption on the campus. All of us are going to have to bear with it a little bit. So if you want something great to happen, there is sometimes a bit of pain that you have to go through. So just keep that in mind. Thank you once again, Rahul. Thank you all for coming. Good night.